Yeah, that is Hensel. Not surprised at all as Super JJ is going second. Yeah. Bringing Hensel is very, very key as Hensel is a leader that has a lot of potential to mm -hmm. really pressure the opponent when going second in a match due to the power of his leader's mm -hmm. ability. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. 3,000 US dollars on the line. So this doesn't really surprise me, uh, Mogwai, knowing uh, Henseld is such a strong leader on the yeah. red coin, being able to go second, you have such a great amount of pressure you can apply with Henseld, whereas King Bran actually does have a fair, uh, a fair amount of power going first, mm -hmm. just because of the way King Bran tends to work, setting up his graveyard, and uh, the case of Coleman, this is, now this is a Siri Nova list uh, that is worth noting. Um, however, being able to play uh, King Bran into cards like Morkfarg, Olgeard, and Wolfsbane, which is likely what's going to be the standard opening here from uh, Coleman, as uh, there is Wolfsbane, Morkvarg, and Olgeard selected. All these cards go into the graveyard, a little boost on the units that are put in there, and Wolfsbane starts ticking in three turns. Uh, that's going to be a difference of 12 points, so uh, Coleman doing the, tra the tra traditional Skellige setup, I would say, for this opening play. It is traditional, but it's also very uh, unique when it comes to Coleman, as most King Brand Nova decks nowadays are running the likes of Double Raider and mm -hmm. uh, Old Gear for the carryover. But Coleman opts to go for more carryover to be able to have that advantage in the mirror, and also opts to go for Wolfsbane, taking up a gold slot for the high tempo play that is two points higher than Raider, even though it is uh, delayed. And it's a very unique approach. I, I, I do like his variant of Brand. It's perhaps my personal favorite, but Super JJ is very well known for his skills with Hensel, perhaps one of the most scary Hensel players I've ever seen. We do, we can go uh, have a little bit of a throwback here and remember mm -hmm. the 4 million IQ play <laughs> back then <laughs> in the last one open. So will we see the 5 million IQ play? It's true, he did, um, and uh, you, what you're referencing right there is uh, in reference to the uh, the great golden dragon villain, Trent Murth, mm -hmm. which is present there on the, uh, on the right side of Super JJ's hand. Uh, really, really strong card that uh, will uh, it's known for burning things down. Ronvid being the opening play here for Super JJ, a crewman that persists throughout the game, uh, not really able to be removed totally. He always seems to come back. Even though he does come back weak, he still uh, is able to apply that crewman bonus from round to round. So being able to establish that as an opening play at 11 usually is pretty good as a proactive play, as Coleman is going to go ahead and play that Clan Demon Pirate Captain, which will be getting the warship out. Uh, which automatically will kill the pirate captain, but start start the snowball effect, starting that engine up with the light longship, as you can see on the side of the screen there. I love how the captain calls onto the ship and then the ship kills him. You know, it's, <laughs> yes, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's lore friendly. I think <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the captain goes down with his ship, even if his ship <laughs> doesn't even go down. Yep. <laughs> now, one of the important things to note about this matchup, one of the most intriguing things, is that while Coleman does have a very powerful win condition in Siri Nova, Super JJ has the perfect answer for it. And if he's able to take control of round one and, uh, well, win round one and take control of round two, and that is that big gold dragon at the far right mm -hmm. of his hand. Villain Tretermeth is its name. It is his hand strength, as you can see, gold, that has a three uh, countdown tr uh, timer in which after the countdown timer goes down, it basically scorches and eliminates the strongest unit on either side of the board. And Siri Nova is a power play, boosting yourself up to 25 points if your deck is built the proper way, having two copies exactly of each bronze card in said deck. So if Super JJ preserves Viltrameth for the third round, which I definitely expect him to do, he could just completely obliterate the uh, the win condition of, of Coleman. And that is something that Coleman has to try to avoid mm -hmm. by Honestly, winning round one, he needs to be in control of round two. Yeah, he needs to bleed Super JJ out of those resources yep. or get him down to a, to a, a hand state where he's not able to really have Villain Trent exactly. go off. Because unlike a card like Geralt Igni, which can instantly answer Siri Nova, um, you know, if you are able to play the last card, Villain Trentenworth you can play in advance, and he'll still catch that 25-point card. So, you know, Villain Trentenworth is actually very good in this matchup specifically. As Super JJ drops the battering ram to knock, uh, to knock some points down here, Miguel, what do you think about the summoning? Or sorry, what do you think about the uh, the muzzle in this matchup? What do you think Super JJ is going to try to grab? As Morkvarg is already out of contention for that yeah. decision. I was going to say Morkvarg, but I mean that light longship is a very juicy target. I mean, is that the max value? It's at eight. We yeah. think muzzle will be sixteen points, and it will also stop a very important engine of Coleman. Now, something else, something very important here to point out is that both players have the ways to react to spies as Coleman has Ulderic and Summoning Circle while Super JJ has his own spy in Taller and his own Summoning Circle. So Super JJ's strategy of utilizing the spy to uh, get the Dun Banner like mm -hmm. cavalry out will not work there out. It is. And and there's there's the that muzzle. muzzle, yeah. Mm -hmm. There it is. 
So yeah, we're talking about Summoning Circle now. If you've been playing on the ladder, if you've seen some competitive games, you know that uh, in round two, Chet, generally this happens in round two, yeah. a little bit of a spy <clears throat> game happens. You know, one spy goes over, you're trying to get card advantage, your opponent can answer with Summoning Circle to copy that spy or answer with their own spy. Yes. And then the opponent can answer with their Summoning Circle and drop the spy on their side. We see all of those pieces in both players' hands. We both have spies, we both have Summoning Circles. So there will be a lot of spy game happening at some point in this game. That muzzle is actually quite devastating for Coleman. Not mm -hmm. only does it disrupt the engine play now, because that long ship not only does it get, uh, technically give you one point each turn by damaging a unit to the right and then boosting itself by two, it also empowers the Marauders by damaging the units as the Marauders will get beefier because of that. But on top of all this, he will not be able to resurrect it with the uh, Corsair, mm -hmm. which he does have the Clan Corsair, which is a three strength unit that is lying in his deck that is utilized to resurrect the ships. Uh, so one of the Clan Corsairs is ultimately going to be dead in this game, and that is massive. That's actually a very big deal that's going to potentially affect his late game, especially if he needs to be able to push efficiently in round two, for example, or in a relatively long round three. Yeah, uh, Siri Nova decks, uh, and really any deck that has kind of a restriction on deck building, tends to try to maximize efficiency like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, having that one card, like the Clan Corsair, able to... Uh, just you know, you have you have one one reason why you have it, and that's to make sure that you can get your snowball pieces out more than one round, uh, as most resurrection cards tend to do. So yeah, it definitely kind of debilitates the strategy here as uh, as we go into uh, as we go into further into this round here. Uh, it's interesting to note, and one thing I wanted to talk about Super JJ's Hensel list. Uh, if you watched Challenger two and you've kind of been playing Gwen for the last couple of months, uh, you may not you ha probably haven't seen a lot of Hensel lately on the ladder, at least. Uh, I haven't personally, but Henselt hasn't changed too much as far as power level is concerned in the competitive way. Uh, we've seen some new tools come in like Winch, but uh, like pound for pound, Henselt hasn't had to change too much to still be a really strong tournament pick here for Northern Realms. I think this is an excellent chance to actually discard the Clan Corsair because one of the two is going to be dead and he can uh, get rid of it, take the Reconnaissance, which will thin it through his deck more. Probably fishing for Igni right there mm -hmm. uh, as he would be able to potentially line them up, but actually never mind because that ship is at 10 strength after it took the hit. Uh, something I like to point out here is the synergy going on with a light long ship on Super JJ's side as it will be damaging the machine and then he can play the Siege Master, as you can see right there, which will heal the machine and then proc its deploy ability alongside the crew and boost so JJ in a very mm. solid position especially considering both players are at an equal card state of seven and JJ has 10 points lead and there comes the summoning the circle to spy game begins power. yeah yep here we go so we're gonna see what super JJ is uh, looking at as far as choices are concerned because in this situation JJ will have to discard something and uh, it is gonna be a discarded reinforced uh, ballista and the pickup of Winch in this situation. Mm. So Winch is very interesting with Henselt as, as Winch does uh, create a machine, a Northern Realms machine, uh, and Henselt has the ability to uh, source additional copies of bronze cards and put them onto the board. If Winch creates, um, in Super JJ's situation, a battering ram or a reinforced ballista, he'll be able to actually, well, not in reinforced ballista's here. case because he did oh. just discard one. Oh. So he's probably looking for battering rams here because he does run a card, uh, Nanika, which is able to put these cards back into the deck and uh, Henselt can come out pulling three or possibly four machines at once, making it a devastating yep. late game play. Indeed, we see uh, Coloman draw into his win condition right there, Siri Nova. You guys may be thinking a one strength gold. Why would you have run that? Well, if you are running two copies of each bronze card, like I mentioned earlier, she will buff herself by 24 points and actually not buff, strengthen which means that it cannot be debuffed by a lot of uh, several card effects. But again, going back to that Vildermeth in uh, Super JJ's hand, that is the answer. All JJ has to do here is win round one and take the, the control of the second round to set up a perfect round three in which he can uh, play Vildermeth and just deny that, that immense mm. value. Like that would make Vildermeth worth a total of 35 points. And down goes the Siege Master, I'm gonna heal officer. the Reinforced Ballista by gentleman. two and you're gonna proc it twice with the deploy uh, ability and the crewman. JJ taking a fairly commanding lead here point-wise. Uh, should be able to keep this, uh, keep this together, although those Berserker Marauders, they tend to come down as huge bronze mm -hmm. units, so yep. Skellige can fight very, very well for round one. Uh, but there is, of course, the Scorch in Super JJ's hand. Now, at the moment, JJ is uh, holding on to the biggest and strongest units on the board. Scorch will destroy the highest unit no matter what side of the board it's on. 
JJ needs to find a good time to use it. If he's fighting for, uh, if he's fighting for this round, he will only I have limited nothing. amount of uh, limited amounts of uh, opportunities to use that card. So he may have to take the best opportunity or be forced to pass. Now, one of the intriguing things here about Super JJ's, uh, basically he, he, the way he's targeting that ship, is that it could put him in a very awkward spot. Right now, he has the strongest unit as, as the board, even, even though Muzzle was a very strong play. Ooh, we see Hansel already Hansel. onto the Ballista to eliminate it, which is why he was targeting it. But again, I go back to the fact that if he has to rely on Scorch in this round, he will not be able to use it. But it seems that after this swing, he's in a 30-point lead, which is really strong. But Coleman does have one card over him, so he could potentially... Uh, he has resources to catch, you know, catch up. And he could even utilize Siri Nova in round one, knowing that it will get answered in round three. So this is not as straightforward as the game as you would seem. Like a lot of decision making can happen here. And Coleman has shown in the past how well he adapts to unfavorable matchups. And we'll see if he can do that here as well. Yeah, we saw Coleman do a lot of great adaptation in uh, Challenger 2. One of the best best of fives you'll ever see, Coleman nope. taking on yeah. Tailbot in Challenger 2 for the semifinals. A lot of great reaction play and, you know, just his, his ability to kind of go uh, turn for turn and just make the best possible play here as he goes to restore the Pirate Captain to bring up the Corsair and get that and get that uh, that uh, longship out of the graveyard. Because he was down by 31 points there, he needs to find a way to get within striking distance should, should Super JJ pass. He can't uh, risk going down too much in this situation. As Super JJ, uh, we did see summoning circles played from both sides. Three copies of Moonwork are on the board, but Super JJ does still have Taller available to him. Super JJ looking to take this round so he's able to freely play Taller, but he's going to be running out of resources because, you know, he's not about to play Villain Treadmirth in this round, and mm -hmm. Scorch is going to be very difficult to play for him as well. I think Scorch at this point is pretty much impossible as that ship will continue to grow, time. and uh, Coloman is playing really well around it, even though eventually those Marauders have to hit the board. And because he's damaging uh, the cursed units, yeah. he's actually empowering the Marauders and opening up that room for the Scorch. So it's going to be very interesting. As right now, uh, the Marauders represent, I'm going to do a little bit of quick maths here. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven. So right now, uh, the Marauders are worth 16 points, which is still not higher than the uh, ship. So if Coleman is able to stall them out efficiently, he may be able to dodge that Scorch. And with a Spy and a win condition and Vildred Meth in hand, Super JJ, as you said, could run out of place to keep on pushing this round. And if Coleman does take this first round, he will be able to take control of the second one and basically basically get the full value of Nova and dodge the big gold dragon right there. Him or Haim goes down and utilizes hmm. the ability to search for a unit on the opponent, uh, basically a silver unit. He's going to create a silver unit uh, of the opponent's deck, and it is Rombid, which is just an 11 point play. So that was a 15 point gold. I've seen better, but it's also not terrible. Looking perhaps for something a little bit more interesting than that. Of course, now Coleman doesn't know what Super JJ is running. There were there are some interesting choices that could have been a Scorch, actually. Uh, so that, there, there were some options there that were, that were probably a lot more interesting. I actually might say that they were the worst two choices you could see. We we're not going to see Taller. That's the one silver card that is mm -hmm. exempt uh, from Haim or any create mechanics. Don't source those disloyal card advantage spies that we see Udalric and Taller in this particular matchup. But, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. Coleman's going to take that right there. And Super JJ is uh, going to pass going here. To the there weren't a lot more options here for him. I mean, I... Uh, Coleman's going to easily take this as we're talking about uh, as we're talking about how strong those Berserker Marauders can get, and of course, getting that double dip damage from Morkfarg, which is a cursed and damaged unit, just made it easy for him to scoop this one up here. As we're going to go into round two, first game of the quarterfinals here at Gwen Open number three. I like that pass from JG. A little bit unfortunate, but he had to go with it as he was not going to be able to play Taller. Uh, in a way that his opponent would, because if, if he played Taller, basically Coleman would immediately pass, as it would put him ahead, and he did not was not able to create the uh, strength gap to be able to play Set Spy. And the fact that he hasn't been able to thin the deck from the Dun Banners the is moment. a huge <laughs> deal. But mm -hmm. uh, we have seen Coleman play his Spy already, and we may see see the thing is you can't really open pass. You know your opponent is running Vildred so you have to push him here. But by pushing him, you have to make sure that you generate a lot of value and not allow JJ to catch up as if he were to do that, 
Uh, Coleman will go down one card for round three, and that will be pretty <coughs> devastating against a control deck like this. Coleman taking a peek at Super JJ's graveyard. Uh, the UI changes over since Challenger, and now make this a lot easier for yes. people to maybe follow along. <laughs> what's going on with the Mulligan yeah. State? What's going on with the graveyard? So. I think that's absolutely fantastic, and we're, we're reaping those rewards as well from the casting standpoint. Just a lot of great upgrades mm. going on with the UI, uh, as far as the information presented to the player and to the viewer. As the Clan Beastmaster comes out here, Coleman gets his Ron vid back here, as Super JJ will eventually get his back as well at the end of his turn. But it's interesting, Coleman has, uh, you know, between Siri Nova and, uh, you know, the Berserker Marauder, will will uh, be better in a long round here. So will Coleman want this to be the longer round or round three? And the, the point that we've been making over the course of this game is bleeding Super JJ out of resources is something that's going to have to be done by Coleman, but Coleman can't really get Super JJ so out of resources that yeah. Villain Trettenworth can't be played as he's down on two cards at this point Super JJ will be drawing into a, drawing a card and will always have that three card buffer unless Coleman can go for the 2-0, which is unlikely. Now, one key thing about that uh, Beastmaster play is that it was completely and utterly calculated here as it put him 20 points ahead of Super JJ. Oh. And down goes oh. Vildred. This is huge. This is so big. Yeah, this is for unexpected. JJ. He can no longer answer, uh, unless he plays Taller in round three, he can no longer answer Siri Nova with a Scorch. Well, unless he holds on to the Scorch. Yeah. The Scorch itself. No, no, but, but, but if he has last play, I, I mean, like, because yeah. right now, if Coleman were to pass, uh, JJ will play a card. Yep. The thing is, he does have the Spy, but you have to play a Spy in round three. You're giving your opponent 13 points, which does put you behind, but it does give him the ability to answer Siri Nova. But the thing is, will that be enough? This is, this is massive mm. here. Excellent yeah. pass by Coleman. Yeah, how is, how is JJ going to navigate this? I mean, I think JJ's I think JJ's plan was really just, okay, you want to go into this round? I'm going to make this really tough for you. And Coleman's like, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, because you will have to go down, you know, you'll have to make a fairly, uh, a, a fairly invested play here. That goes to Battering Ram on Battery to Ram's the gonna get it here. done, yeah. Yep. This is going to be very interesting because Super JJ, like I said, will be able to answer Siri Nova if he does preserve Talor, but he needs to be careful with his mulligans here because Dun Banners can come. I mean, even though if he draws it, like if he doesn't draw a Dun Banner, okay, that's great. The fact that, that he drew the Dun Banner is huge because he can replace it and blacklist it as well, and he gets Shani on top of that. The cool thing is that Talor's value can overall be uh, mitigated because of the Dun Banner as it will basically uh, make Talor worth mm -hmm. minus one point in instead of minus 13. Uh, which is very, very massive. This is a very interesting round three. We see Geralt Igni in the hand of Coleman as well, which is going to have a difficult time finding target, especially in such a, a short round. I don't, I don't know if that Geralt Igni will be able to to hit yeah. home here, but that's Nova that will be able to get in. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to get answered though. Definitely. For sure, for sure. Yeah. There you see on the side there, the Dun Banner. So JJ is putting himself in a position where he will absolutely be losing by 20 and being able to play taller into Coleman's carryover just made that a little bit easier for him. So he's going to get 12 points of that, 13 points by right back. And he's going to also get last play, last play very, be, very important because it's going to be answering Siri Nova. But will it be enough? We see 29 points for Coleman, but it, there goes the aye aye, sir, the Dun Banner. Uh, it is a very special unit for any new players watching. This unit basically auto spawns from the deck if your opponent is, has a 21 point lead or higher. And it's proc very easily, has very good synergies with the likes of Thaler as you're giving your opponent uh, 13 extra points and drawing a card and basically stalling out a little bit your own proactive play. And it also mitigates that. Uh, that value that you're giving your opponent by the vast majority of points, basically. So this is very, very important because, as I said prior, a very reactive deck like Hensolt relies a lot on having that last say, especially if you have a card like Scorch. So him being able to eliminate the 25 points of Siri Nova is extremely important. But at the same time, Coleman has a very sizable lead here. And uh, JJ has a lot of climbing to do. I like this play. This weakens the Marauder. He, that was not a coincidence. He targeted those two cursed units to uh, take two points from Berserker Marauder later down the line. And that could make the difference right here as both players have four cards in their hand. But Coleman does have a seven point lead. It's going to come down to that Igni though. Will that Igni find value in this match? 
Berserker, Berserker Marauders will still have a, you know, in a long round, you can still get a lot of value, but you you, you just showed right there, I mean, we got plus one on the Berserker Marauder, and the next Berserker Marauder is only going to get plus two, counting the Marauder that was just played. Mm -hmm. So not really a lot of the value that you're looking at these days in Gwent. Bronzes tend to be yes. good when they hit about 14 or 15 mm -hmm. points. Uh, so playing something for 10 or for 9... Uh, or even for 11 is just not quite what you need if you're trying to maximize your value. Uh, Coleman has Geralt Igni in hand. Now, you just saw it on the side there. Any of these rows that Super JJ creates that goes over 25 points is susceptible to Geralt Igni scorching the highest unit on that row. Super mm -hmm. JJ is probably yeah. not going to be able to set, in, be able to set that up for Coleman. So that's just going to be a, a fairly dead gold here, as well as having the answer to Siri Nova with the scorch. Super JJ is in a great position right now. We see Neneke uh, hit the board there for 12 points. Uh, not really going to utilize much of it. Uh, it not going to gain any any value really from its ability. As we see a rather weak, as you said, Berserker Marauder hit the board here, uh, getting Kolomon up by 17 points. But he has so much power. And I'm talking about Super JJ. That mm -hmm. winch can get quite a lot of value. But he has to be very careful because he does have a crewman in the range row. But the range row is already quite stacked. Uh, if that that machine were something like a siege tower, for example, it would give Igni a target. Mm -hmm. So JG has to really work on not exceeding that uh, 25 point mark, which in which Igni will occur. So if he's able to avoid Igni, uh, because of the low value of the Marauders by that key uh, reinforced ballista right there, this could mean uh, a victory for JJ. It's going to come down to that. We're going to see Shani hit the board on the siege road. JJ clearly playing around Geralt Digny, and that siege master does not put him at 25. It only ups him to 22. That's an excellent res. Man, JJ playing really well here. Both scores are tied, but if Amy's only worth five points, it will mean the end of Coleman here. As Siri Nova goes down, mm. and it's going to get answered, man. Oh, boy gonna get answered I think Coleman like you, you want to hold Igni to see if, like, just to see if maybe there's a chance you might be able to get some value here but JJ's probably not gonna even take the risk in this situation mm -hmm. easy scorch right here for Super JJ really no point in waiting you're not gonna get a better target than that and that is the target that is going to be that That's is gonna it. be it I mean well, well, well we're looking ahead here there's the girl and Igni not finding a target on that row 22 not gonna be enough the winch with the crewman should be enough here I don't really think there's a pull that you can get that wouldn't be able to get yeah. Six points right now. So Super JJ looking to take this first match here of the quarterfinals. He's going to go up, oh, get that ballista. Nice. Lots of extra points. Nice shelf there for Super JJ. It's going to be game one going to Super JJ versus Colomon there. Ron been saying hello one last time before going to sleep finally into the salty seas of Skellige. Super JJ is going to take this one. And uh, Hensel doing work on the red coin as he does. And uh, Siri Nova will live to fight again another day for Colomon. As, uh, Excellent going game. To game two. Great game. I mean, it played out exactly as each mm -hmm. player probably putting each other on specific card. JJ being able to play that uh, taller there in round two, able to get that last card, which ultimately was important. Geralt Igni not really coming to any fruition for Coleman. A much better card to have in round one or a round that you have more control over as far as length, so mm -hmm. you can get that extra value. But things didn't really pan out for Coleman. Things went perfectly for JJ. The villain Trenton Mirth play in round two was really good, I thought. Yeah, I, I love that uh, series, honestly. That, that game was fantastic. Both players did really well. Coleman really uh, acknowledged what his win condition was, but JJ was able to really, very efficiently adapt, especially in that round two. Letting go of Vithramath is not an easy decision to make when you know 100% that your opponent is running Siri Nova. Instead, focusing on keeping that Taller, getting the Dun Banner out of, out of the deck, uh, to mitigate the value and a very close match 42 to 49 that was that was a very nice game mm -hmm. to start off with and we're gonna go into game number two right now jj has ethne and a raucous queen left a raucous queen making a debut mm. uh the debut in this tournament as uh, it is a new leader introduced with a recent expansion as here we go it is nilfgaard the empire versus Scoyatel as JJ surprisingly getting Squaretail through. But as we see, not the standard dwarf list that we're used to seeing. We see Farseers and Brahead Dragoons in his lineup there. JJ's got a really cool Squaretail list as far as, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of humans on the ladder know that Ethna respects nothing human, of course. Uh, Squaretail has a lot of strong bronzes these days. Dwarven Agitators uh, being coupled with cards like Dwarven Skirmisher are just 
devastating bronze plays. We're talking about 15 being good for bronze. How about north of 15 regularly? Uh, that's what Dwarven Skirmishers can do with Dwarven Agitators. Mm -hmm. Your Agitators kind of work as a reverse resurrection. You get your cards from the Dwarven Agitator in round one, and then you actually draw those Skirmishers in round three, and they are even stronger. And of course, you do have your resurrections with Polly Dahlberg and Hattori. And of course, there is the flavor that Super JJ is adding with this. He's got Dragoons and Farseers to push for a long round one. So he's put an engine into an already roaring machine that is Squatel Dwarves. But because he is relying on engines like Red Dragoon and likes of Farseer, he's also vulnerable to the power of Nilfgaard throughout the Imper Enforcers. Nilfgaard is a very efficient faction at the nine uh, opponent units if you know they rely on them on, on a long round. Now, what's key here for uh, Coloman is to start getting uh, out those emissary chains and set up a powerful enforcer to start elim eliminate that Red Dragoon as fast as possible. Uh, we see double infiltrator in his hand as well, and Azir, and the summoning circle too, which I don't know what clear target it has here, as we don't see. I mean, he could potentially decoy Cantarella if that happens, mm. but we see him hovering over Cantarella immediately, gonna that drop it down. Sick. And one of these two cards will go to the bottom of the deck, and the other one will be drawn, as he's gonna pick up Meno and send Igni, or Ooh, he's gonna keep Igni. It's oh. tough, it's interesting. Meno usually Ooh. gets a really good target. However, one of the biggest targets is on the board right now. Now, Coleman is running, you know, these are some really efficient lists. Both players are bringing very efficient lists. Uh, most of the lists from both players have three of bronze, 15 cards, three, 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 and three. Uh, not a lot of one ofs, not a lot of like spice here and there. Just like just a nice bronze core for consistency. So Coleman is running three infiltrators in this situation. He is running three emissaries, three enforcers. Uh, as Super JJ is just going to go ahead and pass, let Coleman go down a card or two to take this 21 point lead away from JJ. The combination of infiltrator plus, I, I assume, Emir. Uh, or no, no, I like this is why he took Igni basically. He he was prepared to go for the summoning circle in case this happened and uh, combine it with Geralt Igni, but that won't be enough to take it either. Uh, even like he can't really utilize Amir uh, turn one because he doesn't have any target to return to his, his hand. And we are gonna see indeed summoning circle happen here to basically place another copy of Cantarella mm. on the melee row and line see. up those two units. Uh, for Ooh. a Geralt Igni that will represent a total of 31 points, but it will not be enough as Super GT is 34 points ahead, so he's gonna have to expend another card as well. As we see Stefan Skellen as the last gold. Oh, never mind, I yeah. forgot about Roach. Never mind. Well, it's it a great card, great card to put at the bottom of your yeah. deck there. Roach is gonna come out whenever a gold card is yeah, played, so Coleman able to get it <laughs> wow. done in one card there. Fantastic player there for That's by huge. Coleman. Being able to well. win on uneven, that's tremendous. Yeah. The, the only downside to this is that uh, Meno is at the bottom of the deck, but he does have his boy, Stefan, to bring him back up. You know, call him again and be like, hey, no, no, we, we need you. Yeah. We actually really need you. Don't, don't, don't be at the bottom of the deck, please. Just have <laughs> something else right there as we go into round two as Coleman has been able to take round one on even and now has the ability to just pressure. Uh, Super JJ, he's debating here what to start off with. You could make a case for him like open passing, but I don't think that's necessary. I think you just pressure here. You set up a strong late game with Stefan Skellen, mm -hmm. which represents five carryover strength. And you get to work, but no, Ooh, never mind. Open pass instead. He's going was, for the edge of play. I like this, though. I, I like was thinking this. about Stefan Skellen being able to source the card so you know you're drawing into in round three. However, Coleman's not going... Why would Coleman cho choose to not play Stefan Skellen here in Mogwai? Well, because if you play Stefan Skellen, uh, it is a 10-point play. And because of the rise of Moe's uh, bronze cards, uh, it is very easy for JJ to overcome that play with one card alone. And so if he does play Stefan Skellen, he sacrifices having one card over his opponent for the last round. And Coleman is very confident in his spy engine to be able to take uh, this in one round. I like this pass a lot the more I think about it, actually, as he has all the components. He has not wasted a single engine. Uh, from from a spy uh, synergy right here, and even though Cantrella is out of the picture, look at this hand. It represents so much power, and having like not only will he have one card over Super JJ, but he will all he also force Super JJ to play that card first. So it's gonna give Coleman a lot of breathing room, especially if you utilize the likes of Meno to uh, get in there. But the thing is, how can he without Cantrella? Is it possible for him to actually draw Meno? I don't think it is. 
I don't think it is either. Yeah, uh, he's not going to play Mano. Oh, okay. That's why I thought, I mean, you make a really good point. You, yeah. sat, you, you, you put yourself at a lot of risk by playing Stefan Skellen. You'd have to maybe, you'd have to invest a lot of power to yeah. try to get ahead of JJ, yes. not, uh, not allowing him to get back. And while that would be a very aggressive approach, going to go conservative on this one. We know how, like, card advantage is very, very important here. Now it's Super JJ going down two cards uh, yeah, with each cool. play here. Coleman is going to be able to have a lot of answers here. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be quite it's going to be tough here as uh, as Super JJ goes ahead and plays one of the most despised cards in the game right now, Polly Dahlberg. But Polly Dahlberg does not have a lot to work with. These have been very short rounds, which means mm -hmm. that Super JJ's graveyard has very limited options. So just going ahead and playing Polly right, Polly right now on a skirmisher that hasn't been strengthened doesn't seem all that bad I as far as like all the choices that are going to be available. I here. like this Dorvin adjective being returned to the deck. What this means is that he cannot decoy Polly, and the reason why Super JJ led off with Polly, which is a play, a play that you tend to preserve to the very you know later portions of the match, is because he analyzes the matchup very well. He mm -hmm. knows that his opponent is playing Vicovaro Medics. Vicovaro Medics can steal the Dwarves and thus deny Pauly any sort of target, and that would be absolutely devastating. But with that Azir play, he not only has the return Roach to his deck, which will be pulled out as soon as he plays the likes of Stefan Skellen or his other gold, like Rainfarn, he's also returned the Dwarven Agitator to the deck to, like I said, deny that decoy potentially onto Pauly, and that's pretty important, especially when uh, Super Ninja can potentially recycle that decoy, even though now, looking at his hand, his most likely target for uh, Ethne will be that Commander's Horn. Mm -hmm. He's setting up the Farseer right there, which unfortunately, unless yeah. he pulls like, no, because he's running for Hedra Goose as well, how is he going to get that, that Farseer to buff every turn? No, not every turn. There's no, no Now, Dragoon no is part of Super JJ's Elven Engine in this deck. Both yep. players playing very Engine. These are both Engine decks, Go however. Super JJ is kind of a hybrid between engine and just pure points, uh, as Squatatel tends to do. But without having the Vriad Dragoon, the Farseer's uh, potential is fairly low in this situation. Something to uh, note uh, out of Super JJ's lineup is that he is running uh, a set of decks that all target a Rockus Queen consume. As you can see, Jade Figurine is in his mm -hmm. hand. That is an excellent uh, solution to Necker as it will convert it into a two-strength silver. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how, you know, later down the line, Coleman works to get that win with that deck. And in this case, Ye Figurine also represents a lot of potential value, as it can completely deny all the strength gains from the Impera Brigade. And he can even recycle it if he needs to, even though I do believe Commander Strong is there. Mm -hmm. there. JJ's taking a look at his uh, Elven Scout picks here. It's creating a card from a bronze card from outside of his deck. Yep. None of these choices are great, really. This is probably points wise the best thing you can get as the Pyrotechnician, but the other Elven Scout in Super JJ's hand could get something like a Hawker Smuggler, mm -hmm. could get something that uh, allows for buffing as like uh, on a on a regular basis to help out with the Farseer. Won't grab a Dragoon though, because Dragoons are already in JJ's deck. So there are, there are possibilities to get a couple of extra boosts on the Farseer, but it won't be as reliable as JJ may have wanted um, in a longer round. Now, I don't think there's actually any unit that JJ can pull with that Elven Scout to buff the Farseer on a consistent basis no, as he happens. is running for Head Dragoon. And Hawker yeah. Smuggler gets buffed generally in the opponent's turn. Right, right, yes. So, but, I mean, if he wasn't running that unit, that would that would totally happen. But this Vicovaro Medic early on onto the Head Dragoon is very important, especially considering the fact that JJ has... He doesn't have, like, the most control options. I mean, you don't want to waste a Jade Figurine on that Head Dragoon. I mean, you could utilize the Yorveth Meditation, but you kind of want to hold on to that. Uh, for more beefy units as we see him uh, gonna drop um, I, I missed that card. What is he gonna play here? Uh, it's gonna be the other Elven Scout here. Ah, there you go, there you go. Yeah. So let's take a look at what JJ has to pick Maybe this time. Well, arm. it's gonna nice. be a Sword Master. We didn't get to see the other options, but JJ must have uh, liked that option I mean, that significantly great. more than the other two as he picked it rapidly. Uh, yeah, getting the Dragoon. So, so Coleman has completely stripped JJ's graveyard completely. Uh, you may not know, like over the history of Gwent, you may not know Squaytel as a graveyard faction, but lately they have been. Right now, a lot of those plays have been nullified Your here, humbles. right down to the decoy on Polly, as uh, as the as there is now nothing available in JJ's graveyard. So, uh, you know, there is uh, Hatori. Uh, if that card were to My come up, which I don't think it will. Uh, is doesn't really have a target at all in this situation. The decoy here won't be used on Polly because Polly has nothing to pull from the graveyard anymore. Although decoy is still a boost. I mean, if we're looking for some silver linings on these silver cards for Super JJ, but JJ still has a lot of power cards here and Yorveth Meditation 
Isengrim Outlaw can produce uh, all sorts of elves, and then Barkley uh, Elves, of course, can grab uh, all sorts of stuff as well. Dwarven Skirmisher and uh, Dwarven Agitators uh, are, are it, really, at this point. Palamon has a lot of power in hand and still has a lot of breathing room as well. Those triple and pair enforcers are going to start hitting really hard. Right now he's up to a very slow start, which is kind of one of the weaknesses uh, Nilfgaard Spies has. But when you are in round three and you know that there's going to be no more passing, mm -hmm. you're going to go all in. Uh, this is quite the setup happening here as he's going he's gonna to play a Sangram Outlaw. Definitely going to go for the middle option there at middle end, which deals six damage to... Uh, the, uh, two far units on a row. Basically, the, the far left and the far right unit on the same row. And because of uh, Kolomon's positioning, he did mitigate five damage from that by placing the Vic of Medic on the far left. Like I said, these are the best players in the world, and they play around everything, especially considering Insengram Outlaw is a very common choice uh, for a deck like this. So it's going to be very intriguing because he still has the power of Emir to cycle potentially a Vic of Medic. And he's going to start playing a lot of uh, spies now. That early infiltrator makes a lot of sense because you want to generate as many spies as possible before you stop dropping down those enforcers mm -hmm. because enforcers now gain the value immediately uh, in proportion to the amount of spies you have generated. So, like I said, uh, Spy Nilfgaard has a bit of a slow start, but once the engines start getting their value, it is extremely powerful. If not by strength. By and down goes the second infiltrator. Like I said, he's trying to generate as many spies as he can, and uh, we're gonna we're about to see perhaps the first enforcer hit the board soon, and then uh, start cycling through those emissaries with the Vicovaro medics to start getting a nice chain. You can utilize three Vicovaro medics because of Emir. So Emir basically represents like a seven strength Vicovaro medic, which is very powerful, especially because it gives you another uh, option to proc those spies. Do you think, uh, now I'm, I'm just thinking about Stefan Skellen here. I mean, we, we, I, we have a rough idea of how Coleman's going to be playing this out. As you said, he's already building up the spies. The enforcers are going to be able to proc on play for each spy on the board and, of yeah. course, every future uh, spy that is played. Devastating engine, still especially still when you can play all three in a long round three. Although you don't need it to be too long because now they, they, do, they do proc when you play them. But I'm looking at stuff like Stefan Skellen. Do you think Stefan Skellen might just be put, uh, putting a bronze card at the top of the deck, buffing it just because an emissary may likely pull it later just to give a little bit extra oomph. Mm -hmm. I assume that the Enforcer yeah. will be knocking out one of these emissaries for the Vicovaro uh, medic to pull. Mm -hmm. So he's probably going to put an Emperor Brigade on top and then give it that boost and then pull it with uh, with an emissary. I actually think he's going to target a unit that he wants to uh, pull out with Brain Farn. He's going to present uh, Stefan Skellen for quite late in the game. Mm -hmm. Set up a unit on the top of the deck, buff it by five, and leave Rain Farm for the last play, in which it cannot be answered, and uh, go for Rain Farm onto Joaquim which will pull the top card of the deck and then have his strongest play lined up. And like I said, uh, Super JJ, because he is uh, a card down and had to go first, will not be able to do this as he decoys Milan right there and is going to be able to eliminate the Enforcer and get the full value out of it this time, even though because of the decoy, it actually does represent a little bit less. Super JJ with a very massive lead as of right now, but this is when Coleman starts to get to work. He has so much power here. And one of the things to point out is that with the Impera Enforcers, you kind of have to, you know, be careful with what you hit, especially because uh, cards like Hattori exist. So you don't want to precisely, especially now that you see Decoy, you don't want to eliminate anything per se. Like you just want to get the mm -hmm. damage value out of it. Like the things you want to kill are the Emissary, so you can recycle them. It's tough here. I mean, there's. We won't count JJ yet. JJ has a ton of power in his hand. He yes, has the Artifact he does, Compression, he does. which turns any unit into a two strength Jade figurine. He has Commander's Horn and a double Commander's Horn with Ethna being able to replay any special card that's been played. Plus, Yorveth, Med Yorveth Meditation, whose power only grows based on the board state as he can force two units to duel each other. Unfortunately, Coleman with those extra two cards, that is going to be so huge. Even one extra card is going to be huge. So, Super JJ with a lead. And that lead is going to grow even from here. But I don't know if it's going to be enough because those Vicovaro novices are going to, they represent quite a lot of power because they're likely to pull an Emperor Brigade uh, once if they resurrect a, an emissary that is killed by a future enforcer um, or anything that really goes into JJ's graveyard. Really, there's a lot of potential there. And of course, with Stefan Skellen and Rainfarn, with that massive bomb of a play that you outlined later, it's going to be really tough. I don't envy JJ's position in this situation. Because JJ is forced to play his cards earlier on due to Coleman's open pass in round two, 
Uh, not only the likes of Jay Figurine, but your best meditation will f have a hard time finding that massive value that they can potentially get. We do see two very powerful plays here, as you mentioned earlier, which is Commander's Horn followed by Ethne, which are 20 points and 25, respectively, as he will most likely recycle that with Ethne later down the line. Uh, what's very key here is for Coleman to try to basically preserve as much power as he can uh, in his hand. And yeah, I like the fact that he's playing the Enforcers now, even though he could potentially you know, generate, um, yeah, I, I think it forces what you have to play here. I think mm -hmm. you, you preserve Stefan Skellen for later, especially because you do plan on utilizing both Vicar Varda to cycle through more spies or emissaries, and those emissaries will pick uh, two cards and they add the other one. So the the other card that's not picked is added randomly into the deck, right? So if you play Stefan Skellen first, you do enter the risk of uh, not getting the target you need with Rain Farm, but at the same time, you're going to pull that unit anyways mm -hmm. with the emissaries. Yeah. So I think Stefan Skellen is actually yeah, a pretty good play here. Okay, never mind, because he's placing the Kalex. So now, not only is Stefan a 15-point play, he set up Kalek on top of the deck, which means that that will 100% be the target that Joaquin pulls out. And that, that means so much. That means so much. That last play is going to be so strong as Super JJ is, one of his strongest plays is out of the window. And if Coleman is able to hold on to the Impera Brigades waiting in his deck and wait out for the likes of Jay Figurine and Yorvith Meditation to hit the board, you'll be able mm -hmm. to avoid all that value loss and you're going to see him climb back up. The snowball potential of this archetype is so, so, so powerful. Yorvith Meditation is at a high point at this point with a 7 and 11 on the board representing 16 points in the duel. And if you're not really no familiar... If you're not familiar with Yorveth Meditation forcing two units to duel each other, it means that those two units that are forced to duel each other will trade blows, each unit's strength being applied to the other unit until only one unit remains. So it is a kind of a blow back and forth. So you want to, you want to, there's like a perfect sort of situation where you want to hit like something into like eight or 13. So one unit is left with one. So you really just maximize that value. At the moment, seven and 11 is the best combination right now. And here comes Coleman dropping that rain farm. This is going to be an absolutely massive play as JJ has already played his second commander's horn with Ethna. The lead you see now from JJ is probably the largest lead that he'll have because a lot's going to get done here. Cal yeah. coming down at 17 points, and he's going to drop an emissary to keep things going. Yeah, this is where he starts sharing a lot of power, but this is also rather bad for Coleman as he's opening up that Yorveth Meditation. We're looking at two very, very large units, and not only Yorveth Meditation, but Jade Figuring are going to be able to find decent value, but look at the power oh my goodness. of that Rain Farm. He was, he was like at 49 points, and he's like at 80. Ray, this is so massive. Like, he's already been able to catch up. He's still one card over JJ. And JJ is looking at a 12-point skirmisher, a Jade figurine that could represent a total of uh, 16 points right now and deny, you know, that Imperial Brigade from growing even further. And then a Yorvith Meditation that uh, I don't have a bachelor's degree in math, so it's going to take me a while to calculate that. But... Coleman still has a lot of power, but even though Rainfar was his most powerful play, we do see the J figurine. That's an excellent play. Like, you don't want to preserve that any longer. Like, it's going to represent the same value whether you play it now or later. And he is still 30 points ahead, but Coleman has set up a field plagued with spies, and that enforcer is going to hit hard. And those Vic of our medics are going to represent a lot of power. Even though JJ has a 30 point lead. Mm -hmm. This is where he starts to, you know, turn things around. Now, I don't know exactly how it's going to pan out because that Yorveth Meditation could represent a tremendous swing, especially because we're looking at uh, Stefan Skellen and Kalak. 11 into 17. 24. Seems like, yeah, 24 that, is the duel there. Uh, the 18 plus, to 11 was points? also really good. Uh, no, that's not, not including Yorveth, I believe. That's a lot. That's a powerful goal right there. 27 points is no joke. Down goes the enforcer. But that will, that, yeah, that'll probably continue. That probably will end up being the best URF meditation you'll see um, at this point because the Imperial Brigades aren't on the board anymore. Uh, they aren't growing anymore. The, the strength levels are fairly static. I don't think anything's going to change here. Uh, the Imperial Brigade that would drop in the future um, could end up growing to the point where it is an even better, it creates a better Yorveth meditation for JJ. Scores a little closer than I anticipated it being here, but Coleman has those cards. 
I, I would not be surprised to. He has to play Amir now because he wants to preserve that four strength uh, Vicavaro medic for later, even though he can play it afterwards. But I think uh, there's not much reason not to play it. I mean, unless you're looking to balance something else, but I don't know why you would balance anything uh, rather than a Vicavaro medic here. But he is going to play the first one. Assuming he's, he's going to preserve uh, his Amir for his second to last play and balance that last one, it seems. The beefier Vicar Roman is going to hit the Check board, going to search for an emissary. He sent two emissaries to the graveyard because he still has one more emissary in his deck, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, because when he went for a rain fart, he, we saw both Joaquim and the emissary right there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see... Uh, we see the infiltrator here, which is going to proc strength. both enforcers and, and represent strength. a total of 14 points on its own without counting, you know, the minus two from uh, from said emissary right there. And it's going to put Coleman back. Uh, yeah, he's like, he's one point behind. And this year of imitation represents a lot, but Emir into double Vicovora Medic is so strong. This is very tight, though. Yeah. Because as we said earlier, 27 points from a gold is, is very, very strong. But Emir... And Vicovaro Medic, and that Vicovaro Medic getting buffed each turn. I love the fact that he's preserving that last one uh, for as long as possible so that he can actually, even though the buffs are basically going to reset after, you know, he returns it to his hand, but he's in a very, very nice spot. We're going to see his last play here, Yorveth Meditation. I like to call him Yorveth I Siesta. do believe that this is a 20, nope, we were, you know what, I think I wasn't factoring in the, uh, the, the, the point total on, uh, no, that is right. Yeah, it was about 27 points, I think. Um, it's a tough, I, I it's a tough card to cast. Let's be I, honest, guys. Let's be honest between I, you and me and everybody I, watching. I, I, I kind of Your meditation that as a is there. a tough card to cast. I do believe that was 27 points, though. I mean, it, it's it's easy to calculate at this point. Uh, Stefan Skelling was 11, and he was at 60. It was at 87. It was, that it was 27 points. Yeah. It was 27 We're points. We're good. We're good then. Hey. <laughs> so we, we haven't screwed up yet. <laughs> so so I mean so now this is going to be the final score here. 91 mm. is the score to beat. Coleman has his work cut out for him. This is too powerful. This is this is way too powerful. Emir Sama is mm. going to get last, that into that emissary right there. Get it? Yep. That oh, was yeah. there was one more emissary You're getting the last sure. card right there. The Impera Brigade go going up to 95, and he doesn't even need. He doesn't even need his last card. He does not even need his last card. That is enough. That is just so strong with all those spies set up in the board. That's it. Coleman takes the second game. The score goes to one and one, and we are in for quite the exciting series, ladies and gentlemen. JJ did not destroy with Scoia'tael, as many people maybe predicted. Scoia'tael was either going to be banned or it was just going to crush. JJ is going to have to seek a win out uh, with uh, with his deck. Now, I do believe that his deck, that probably didn't go the way Super JJ planned. He has far Seers, he has three Dragoons and two far Seers. Mm. He's looking to develop yep. that engine. He didn't get a long round to have that engine running. He didn't get a long round really at all. Round one and round two were over very quickly. Uh, so we just played a long round three where Coleman's engine was superior in that situation. Plus he got those cards. Didn't even need that last card, however. Sometimes one card can make the difference and that's all he needed to do. Uh, like we said, Super JJ would have massive leads in that round, but it really wouldn't, it wouldn't really be enough as it would be able to be recouped by Coleman. We are one and one here in the first quarterfinals match of Gwent Open number three. First major tournament of 2018. Pretty momentous as we're gonna find out Who's going to get the big, uh, the big paychecks, and who's going to get the tickets to Challenger tomorrow? Here we go. We see Super GG bringing the Arrakis Queen Consume deck, and we uh, witness Coleman bringing King Brand back again. King Brand, a very reliable deck to run when you're going first, as it does care less about win round one due to its strategy relying on a carryover. And even though Consume in the past did rely on a carryover as well as a strategy, because of the change to how Death Wish works, it is no longer procced in between rounds. So even though Neckers are still very powerful, they don't contribute to that carryover game. So it's safe to say that Coleman will be able to win uh, the carryover game plan and thus make up a little bit for the fact that he's going first as both players are ready to get into it. And this is the third match of today as this is a, a, a <laughs> matchup that's, you know, not as easy to call. Look at the look on JJ's face because he's going over his oh hand my, here. Oh. It is the tournament curse, honestly, oh. Mogwai. How many games of launchers have we cast where players just can't draw the Neckers no. that they need to copy with the Necker Warriors to set up their final round three plan? It's just not looking good. Once again, as much as you can just, you know, you, you know that Consume is, has the potential for Consume, the ceiling on Consume is intensely high, but you need to generate, you need to be playing the Neckers, you need to play Necker Warriors to generate multiple copies in the deck, multiple Consume triggers, so you can just start cycling them and just push ahead by a mountain of points, but it's really, there's not a lot of plays you can make. Super JJ might just go ahead and pass right away. 
<laughs> this is like he doesn't even have marching orders because he has triple slizzard in hand marching orders will either pull a shadow or necker but he doesn't even have that like this is the worst consume hand i've seen in a while like he can't he can't do anything he actually can't do anything the two cards that uh the whispers tribute can pull are either monster's nest or Mandrake, and none of those help him get out the win condition of this deck. I, I don't know exactly what his, pl his plan is. He might be going be... for Barbagazi here just to yeah. get some carryover for the pass. I mean, there's really not a lot he can do here. The question is, does that carry over? That carry over ties with... Yeah, he's got to go with Barbagazi here 100%, right? Unless he wants to go with the Arrakis Behemoth? I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure. Maybe throw a curveball at Coleman because He's going he with the Arrakis Behemoth. Yeah, I mean, okay. he does have consume effects. I mean, it allows him to fight for a round a little bit instead of just kind of rolling over and saying, Welp, didn't get my draws. So at least this uh, this allows him to uh, this allows him to fight for the round a little bit more. Now, now JJ isn't running anything like Erica's Drone or really any other Erica's Behemoth. Even though the Erica's Behemoth as a bronze card is quite strong, tops out at about 20 points, you can get a lot of value out of Behemoth, but Behemoth coming out of Monster Nest, you know, Monster Nest is is often used for the ghoul as, you know, the I'm previous versions here. of Consume ran stuff like the Manticore um, or other high strength, base strength units to get a huge closing play from a monster nest into the ghoul to eat out of the graveyard. JJ's not running those cards, so using monster nest with the Wispus Tribute here uh, is, this is likely his plan all along with monster nest and Wispus. It's going to be very interesting to see how Super GG adapts to this matchup. The fact that he has no way to get a Necker on him to the board. And it hurts because Coleman does not have an answer for Neckers either, especially in his hand. So what what do you do at this point? Like, you've already committed your uh, your Whispers, right? So you you kind of you have to keep on, on pushing here. He's going to go with the fourth tail, going to uh, proc the Arrakis Behemoth twice and go up to 31 points, but that Wolfsbane is going to proc really soon and yeah. gonna provide him with a 12 point swing. And JJ is in a he's, he's in massive trouble here. Like, he can't because the, the big issue is he can start the consumption chains, he can work with the Rand Warriors, and he can cycle uh, more Forktails with his Lizards yeah, after yeah. he eats them with Rands. But the problem is Necker Warriors create a base copy of Necker. So the longer he pushes this round, mm -hmm. the weaker the upcoming copies of Neckers will be. And if he's not able to get <laughs> Neckers into the graveyard as well, that Crone Whispers can also be uh, rather underwhelming as well. Like he has to, like it's gonna come down to exactly when he passes. And I honestly can't say when that's gonna happen. Like this hand is I think so JJ's awful. gonna take this. Oh, uh, never mind. There's the Wolfsbane. Yeah, there's the Wolfsbane. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, trying to get ahead in points against King Brand. One of the reasons why King Brand is so good on the blue coin is because that Wolfsbane affords you a lot of extra tempo. Now, at this point, JJ is probably not gonna be able to get there. There's the pass anyway. He was probably looking to pass one way or another. Needed to do something, needed to get something going here, but nothing was going to happen. JJ's face says it all here. Just wasn't able to get the cards he needed to get things started. But it's not over yet. He is, he is able to draw into an Ecker. It's possible. There's the marching orders and Gels. A mulligan may save him here. No, no, marching orders is enough. Marching, marching orders, orders is on. Uh, yeah, because he's holding all the slizzards, yeah. so that would be Necker automatically. That's true. The, the problem here is Coleman is in the driver's seat. He can uh, decide how long this round goes. So he can really try to disrupt the uh, the chain by passing at the proper time. Now, the reason why Super JJ pushed as hard as he did is because like that pass was not a, a coincidence right there. That pass was meant to basically get that Wolfsbane value out of there. So he basically wanted to play um, enough to get the Wolfsbane to proc and then pass so he will not have to deal with that 12 point swing in a round which he in which he has to win because that would be very devastating for him so uh jj was definitely intending uh to pass because he didn't have necker right but he had to wait out a little bit due to that as we're gonna see marching orders which will pull a shadow 100 percent because oh, yeah, right, of the, the buffs of the neckers here that's actually a, a solid a solid way to start things up like 12 points that's really good. But the thing is, when will Coleman pass? It's hard to say because his deck is very strong in long round as he can uh, get the light long ships out and they will uh, be stronger the longer the round is. But at the same time, Consume Monsters is very, very threatening in the long round as well with the likes of Ran Warriors, which I believe Coleman has no reliable answer to. I mean, as far as Consume is concerned, I think that uh, Coleman doesn't have a lot of like tech for this in this particular deck. He does have answers in other decks, 
But I mean, Coleman's best effort is to just try to get ahead on points and try to deny at least some setup here. But it, it's, you know, here comes the Alzer's double cross, which will pull a Necker Warrior, um, as it is the highest mm -hmm. unit in the deck, as what, what Alzer's double cross is able to do here. <laughs> So now, now the uh, you know the the gang is getting together here. The posse is forming at the bottom of the deck here. So, you know, being able to create a number of neckers at the bottom of the deck, the necker replaces itself whenever it's killed. The Vran starts the buffet. So you start to cycle and you get to build strength and you get to continue to s continuously source neckers from the bottom of the deck uh, onto the board, banking that strength into the Vran, and then creating more neckers which get stronger and stronger with each meal that the Vran takes. So that's kind of the overall strategy that Consume wants to run here. Just constantly eating and replacing, building more Neckers, and continuing to just consume as many times as possible. Super JJ is playing from behind here. He will be able to he will be able to push ahead um, at any point, I think, in this matchup, but Coleman can really pad his lead to the point where Super JJ would have to invest a little bit extra. See, this is one uh, a specific case in which the matchup uh, makes it so that Super JJ is not overly punished due to that uh, opening hand as though this uh, Skellige deck is very very strong uh, it's very efficient too and rather consistent as well it's also more focused on the proactive side of things and because it's so focused on on proactiveness it has it doesn't have the best answers for a deck like consume as it has very little interaction with what the opponent is doing only Geralt Digny really is something that Coleman can use to disrupt the opponent's uh, board and this is very very important to note because uh, JG has been able to get the engine going mm -hmm. and even if we see in a pass uh, eventually from Coleman he already has the the late game set in motion with that Crone uh, Brewis in his hand that one strength uh, gold unit that's basically a bunch of very sad little children just walking <laughs> in <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, no, going no, to have fun with her. It's going to be very difficult for uh, Coleman to be able to overcome that. It's, it's going to be very interesting to see. I think it all comes down to exactly when Coleman passes. Yeah, Bruce is the only one having fun in that card art for sure. <laughs> yeah. Double resurrection on Deathwish units as, as she is able to do, and that's good for uh, that's good for a long round. It kind of creates two engine pieces. Even though the Neckers do come out at a base strength, they are two engine pieces that are able to be consumed as well as the Vran continues to chow down here. And, uh, you know, now at least, you know, JJ went through a couple speed bumps, but he's getting there. He's getting he's getting to where he wants to be. Uh, look at Coleman's lead, though. The lead is intense. So uh, JJ is going to have to start consuming Neckers to really start to, like, jump ahead in points. So setting up a Vran in between the Shadow and the Necker may be what he wants to do next. Coleman deciding how long he wants this round to go, and if it's worthwhile, is he able to 2-0 JJ in this situation? Do you think that's even possible, Migo? Uh, I don't think you can 2-0 a Consume uh, Monsters list, especially once they got their Consume I engines going. Uh, I think what uh, Coleman is trying to do here is he's trying to center his deck as much as possible. So he can follow this up with an Ulderic as he has thinned his deck completely, like he has no more options in his hand barring the uh, Spy. <laughs> to uh, thin through his deck and he's aiming to hit that Igni. If he's able to set up that uh, spy right next to the Vran Warrior, the Vran Warrior will eat it and will go up to 39 strength, which will give him a 44 point Igni. So what Coleman is trying to do here is he's trying to put him in a situation in which uh, Super JJ has to invest uh, an extra card or two to win this round after he passes and thus yeah, uh, set up a strong round in which Siri Nova, you know, is just overly devastating. Regardless of what happens here, the good thing for Coleman is that because he won round one and he does have a spy in hand, he will be able to retain that card advantage. Siri Nova will not be able to be answered, even though in this particular, like if we look at uh, JJ's deck, there's mm -hmm. not really an answer to uh, Siri Nova to begin with as he's not running the likes of Geralt Igni because these two decks are very, very proactive. Like they kind of just focus on what they're doing, but they're very interesting. Like I really like uh, yeah, cool. the, Ooh, there, there it is. There's the Igni. There's the Igni. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Now that Berserker Marauder is going to be huge as well. A lot of damage and curse units on the board right there. Uh, take it away, Mogwai. I'm just going to calculate the... Uh, yeah, the, no, no worries. Of, math time. Don't worry. I'll, math <laughs> time on my side. You guys you yeah. can just keep going yeah. here. This is a lot of units. But basically, uh, that play uh, makes that brand warrior extremely big and thus gives Coleman a chance to get a 44-point play, like I mentioned prior. And I think... The thing is, if you... He's, he's, he's debating whether Berserker Marauder is worth it or not at this point, but I think it definitely is. You keep on pushing, and uh, you then get... Because you, you wait for that Brand Warrior to eat more, because he can't really avoid that Brand Warrior from getting bigger. And if he eats that Brand Warrior, whatever ate it 
will be even bigger. So mm -hmm. uh, that Agni is going to get massive value regardless, and we're going to see Coleman push hard this round. And we may see him try to go for the 2-0, <laughs> but again, 2-0-ing consume is, is rough, man. There is the meatball, as I affectionately call the Erica's Queen, coming down to have her three meals a day. Three square meals a day. Going to cycle one of those neckers here. Jade able to tie it up. See, that's, that's the best part about Consume, is that once you're able to cycle uh, the Neckers with Consume, having a reliable stack, like a reliable uh, source stockpile uh, of the Neckers, you can start to cycle them as much as possible. And the Vrand is going to keep eating. The Erica's Queen gets a meal as well. Now, that 39-point Vrand is not long for this world, I think. Coleman's probably not going to let that be a dead Igni. And, you know, Igni catching a Necker is obviously is, uh, is often not that yeah. worth it. 26. 26. That is point. a thick marauder. Woo. Can I get some hashtag thick marauder, please? Oh my <laughs> lord. He went to the gym. <laughs> and answering the surge in points for JJ with his own surge. I mean, you know, a board like this is exactly like this is a Berserker Marauder's Playground right now. Lots of cursed units, lots of damage units, lots of damage cursed units for the double dip for that thick marauder. That's the beauty of this uh, ship bear deck, as I like to call it. It's while it is, you kind of focus on your own board most of the time. You have to see, really not only sequence, but also position very efficiently to make sure that the most amount of units possible gets damaged by the long ships. So that Marauder can become such a powerful play there. A 26 point bronze is not precisely heard of uh, quite often in Gwent. That is very, very powerful as we see uh, Super JJ going for the Gels. And there Ooh, is the Mandrake. Mandrake the Mandrake is a good. lot of points. That Mandrake is so much. It's gonna erase a lot of points off Coleman's board right here. He's gonna go for the ship instead. I thought maybe the Berserker Marauder, but I mean the ship. The ship is likely to come back later. Well, the Berserker Marauder. Well, the ship's likely to come back later. Ah, uh, well. yeah. As a I mean, there's two but ships. he does have two, and he's already used yeah. one Corsair. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's important to know the ships are seven, and the Marauders are nine. So he's still. It was about. It was. It was. It seems like uh, a point pound for pound hitting the Marauder would have been better, but you know there is a, there is a plan there for JJ. Down goes girl. Here, here. going to target the Brand Warrior on the seas row. And uh, gonna get a 44 point swing for Coleman, which is extremely strong. What a slugfest this matchup has been. Yeah. Just massive, massive plays. Igni for 44, Berserker Marauder dropping for 26, and Mandrake knocking a 23 ship down to one. Just it's nasty, nasty plays here. We went from a tie game at 105, and now look at the disparity in points here for JJ. We t I was talking about a possibility of maybe there being a 2 0. I mean, uh, Coleman still has a lot of points here. And the consume effects of now is starting to get exhausted for JJ. Uh, can that laser target something? Yeah, I can target a four tail, right? No, it, like don't it's like you, grab you a can, necker as well. Could, you can, you can never it. like underestimate the power of this thing. Like this deck has such an easy time generating points. Just this four tail, this four tail is gonna be big. Yeah, because this is gonna cycle the necker again, and then then I mean, <laughs> Bruce. I mean JJ needs to have Bruce in in the short round here as well. Just massive here now. I'm was like at this point the decision now now the decision needs to be made here. Like, is it how much how much more how much more can Coleman really invest into this round? He's got a lead at this point, and that's not nothing. The Priestess of Freya looking to is gonna look at it, continue some action, is gonna keep that soul Siri Nova, that 25 point play being his last remaining card, either to play the 28 point Berserker Marauder. Slugfest. I, I think I, I, I was calling it that even before these, these games started because these are two these are two very very good players. Both have proven themselves uh, in over a number of tournaments now. Uh, Coleman being the finalist in Gwent Challenger, Super JJ making an appearance in every Gwent Open. Both players very very strong. Super JJ just looking for some options here. He's going to have to spend something he doesn't want to spend. He's in trouble. He's, He's in a massive bit of trouble, trouble as neither of these two plays will put him ahead. Now is when Coleman passes. He has one card over his opponent, and that card it's is Siri one. Nova. That is such an important deal. And carryover in Old Gear. This is so big. This this pass is so big. This is how you want it. This is how you take consume out, though. You yes. need to exhaust the resources in round two as much as possible. Excellent. Excellent round two by Coleman. Just pushing in as, as far as he could. And with such a massively powerful proactive deck that consume monsters like, like for those of you who are watching this uh, this event and are, are seeing this game for the first time, Consume Monsters is the most uh, powerful proactive deck in the entire game. Like, no other deck can generate as many amount of points in such a short uh, time. 
and he has to waste his last resource there. That is a win condition as well. And we see Siri Nova and Kolomov's in. I do not see how he can lose this at this point. Don't think JJ can draw anything that saves him at this point. Nope. There's just nothing. Especially There's... with the eight of carryover? Like, what? are you kidding me? <laughs> the muzzle means nothing. The fork tail nope. means nothing. That's going to be it for Super JJ. It's going to be a concede right wow. there. Wow. That is it, Coal Mine. That's how you, that's how you play the consume matchup. You just got to push, push, never relent, never give up. Because if you give up, if you waver, show any moment of weakness against consume, they will drop like a two card combo yeah. on you that is about like, it can go from like 30 to 50 points, just absolutely disgusting. Especially when the Necker has approached 20 points. All you need, I mean, now JJ isn't running popular consume cards like Phoenix or anything like that that really kind of facilitates, you know, some really crazy stuff. But in that situation there, JJ was just out of options. Coleman just kept pushing, and that last card, Siri Nova, I mean, what do you even say about that? Super J didn't have to see it. He already knew that that was a possibility. Forktail isn't going to get the job done, neither is Muzzle. So had to concede. Going to go into game four here. Super JJ is on his last life. Now, but, the good news, yeah, but yep. we're going to say the same thing, Mogwai. Yep. We're talking about JJ's targeting strategy. This right? is where the yeah. matchup, this is where this entire series gets extremely interesting. This is all that matters here. The Conquest format, you have to win with every single deck, and JJ is known for his targeting, and he's perhaps the best at it, in my opinion. And we, I think it's one of the reasons why he's so efficient in the quarterfinals as well. His entire lineup is designed to always defeat consume monsters. What's interesting is that he opts to go with Mirror first, but I mean, he understands his matchups better than we do as mm -hmm. he's been practicing this again and again. I've seen this man uh, practice against consume monsters uh, today, actually. Like, he, he definitely has this matchup in hand, uh, or in his mind, sorry, and he, if you look at his decks, Every single deck has answers. Even his uh, Consume Monsters list has the likes of not only Mandrake, which you can pull with uh, Wispest Tribute, but also Artifact Compression and Muzzle. You guys have been seeing Muzzle being played a lot by Super JJ. You may be wondering why, as that card has fallen a little bit out of flavor recently. And it is because of this. Muzzle can target a Necker and steal it. And if you steal that Necker from the opponent, he cannot continue his strategy. As we see the open pass from JJ here, Mm -hmm. He knows he knows this matchup like extremely well. He knows exactly yeah. what he's doing, and I'm super intrigued to see if Coleman can overcome his prep and find a way to get a win with his last deck. Coleman just needs to win with this consume list, but if JJ has done his homework right. He will stop that from happening. Both players running very similar lists. The bronze core is identical. Three of Decker Warrior, Four Tail, Vran Warrior, Necker, and Slizzard. Mm. So that's not gonna you're not gonna see any variation there. Where you start to see variations are in the silver decisions. Both players are running Mandrake, likely to solve the mirror in some situations, but JJ has that little extra bit in running the artifact compression, which is allowing another solution to Necker plus muzzle, which is another solution to Necker. So I think that in this in this matchup, I think JJ may have the upper hand as far as sheer tech, but it is gonna come down to the draws and in this open pass situation gets JJ the card he will need to just not be able to be tapped out like he was previously even in a long round both players should be able to do things so here comes Coleman's first try let's get a Necker out let's get the strategy going JJ's going to answer right now he's going to take it away with muzzle and he still has his other two options available well he has one he has, he has somebody circle he has somebody circle right there which is uh, very very important uh, but see, that's what that muzzle is for. But mm. the thing is, Coleman does have the answer. As he, he can play Summoning Circle and basically uh, summon another Necker as it was the last unit played. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what is. he's going to go for here. Uh, as you said, he has more options though. He does have Jade Figurine in hand and could actually potentially search for either the Whispers Tribute or even Mandric itself with Gel. So he has three answers for Neckers. And Coleman is basically utilizing his his last way to get a, a Necker here. Yeah, like he has no more no more options to do that. Jade uh, figurine goes down. Marching orders or Mandrake are marching orders and Mandrake are on Gels right now. It could be one or the other. Um, and then they're on the gold side, he could get tribute, which could get the Mandrake. So. It's really interesting. I mean, JJ, it's it's probably a pretty good situation. You can't have all the answers all the time, but this is probably still a pretty good situation. Just deny, deny, deny. Exactly. Like, his deck is designed to defeat this. And we see Coleman. I think Coleman has to pass here. Like, uh, what do you do? Because this is your opportunity. Because you're two points ahead. You will get that extra card, and you will have last say. But two of your Neckers have gone down. There's only one left in your deck. You First of all, you have to draw it. <laughs> and second of all, JJ has the other answer in Gels in hand. Like I said, Gels will 100% uh, search 
no, he, not 100%, he has, yeah. No, not 100%. Uh, never mind. He does have the brew as a... Uh, well, it's Mar there. between Marching Orders and Mandrake on the silver side, um, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, Gelskan would see would see tribute or uh, Wispus tribute or Bruis. So I mean, it's likely that he'll get an answer to the Necker, but it's not a hundred. It's not hundred percent. You're you're right. You're definitely right. This is very interesting right here because now uh, we're fi we're looking into a very long round three. But if one player can have Neckers and the other one can't, yeah, like, no. this will be extremely one sided. He does not get it. He didn't get it. Oh man. No Col Necker. Like he doesn't even have to answer. He has Colmog. Of course he has one in his deck. And oh now my JJ Lord. is going to start. Yeah, oh, the that's the whoa. Colmog not wasting about. any time. <laughs> JJ is <laughs> oh, oh, He man. was like laughing and then he goes like super serious. Wow. <laughs> the, you know, now we've seen some. <laughs> This reminds me a little bit of from Gwen Challenger, oh, wow. where, where, where we were one of the games we had. We had we had Shaggy, uh, who was in a hopeless situation. He had a he had an absolutely bricked hand. A hopeless situation. He conceded with about seven cards in his hand because there was just really no mathematical way he could even get close to winning. And in this situation, Coleman kind of made a new record here as far as early concedes <laughs> in a match because you can see this yeah. is this is important. If you can't get the if you can't get the gang together, get those neckers at your bottom of your deck start the consume train then they I mean that's your strategy it's very much here we go. hit or miss here this we go, is boys. it Game the five. last match are the you last. not entertained so far my friends we do see muzzle in his opening hand he has to search for his other answers that includes the likes of artifact compression if he's able to get artifact compression which he can search for with Isengrim outlaw uh he can also recycle it with it. ethne he has the answer for neckers if he's Ooh, able to deny boy, all the oh neckers here then he just completely kills his game. And Coleman got all three. He's I mean, very happy. Like, look at him. Like, he, he, he has everything be, he needs. This could be another short oh one. Oh, my like, God. shorter than you I'm think. telling you, it all came down to this. Oh, we, we knew this. We were talking about this earlier. We were looking at the deck list. Like, this, I love JG's approach of targeting. I think you kind of have to take a risk. And he predicted many people would bring this archetype. And he got matched up against a player who, who relied on consume monsters. Mm -hmm. As many of the players are running Arrakis Queen as well, as it is the most powerful proactive deck, like I mentioned. And the fact that he has these answers is tremendous. Like, J like shout outs to JJ's preparation, man. That's absolutely outstanding here. I mean, J Super JJ and Gwen open number one, he targeted Mill. Did he run into any Mill? He didn't. Gwen open number two, he yeah. targeted, he had weather removal, he targeted weather. Did it help him that much? No, he had a lot of low value bronzes. This time he's targeting consume and it's going to pay off. Third I think, time's a charm, baby. This is going to be, this is going to be grab it, compress mine. it, compress it. It's mine. It's mine. <laughs> Dad, one necker down, two more to go. If he's able to eliminate every single one of them, I it's mean, over. Squirtle doesn't need a lot of help, but this is this is a little this extra over. icing it, on a delicious cake here for JJ. Yeah. I mean, oh my lord! I, I mean, this is just it's favorable. We're gonna say it's favorable right now, and <laughs> Coleman is gonna make the final decision on how favorable it is for JJ. Down goes the second one. This is the key moment. He, yeah, he's hovering over a Sangram Outlaw. A Sangram Outlaw will spawn a will will uh, fish for one of his silver cards. Yep. And we're going to see Artifact Compression there. Play a Bronze. There it is. There it is. Yeah. This is perfect. I mean, as long as he can click the right button, click the right <laughs> card. JJ's, well, he clicked he's on, on Ethne next pilot. turn. Ethne is going to be the follow-up play here. It's Look Coleman. at Coleman's face. He knows what's happening. Oh, man. Mm. He's just... What can he do? Like, what can you do at this point? Oh, my there God. This is crazy. This is crazy. JJ. No! JJ! That's it! JJ! I mean, JJ! Oh, JJ. Wow. One of I the knew. two fastest games. <laughs> the two Steve fastest Glenn. games you've ever seen in a tournament <laughs> just occurred as JJ absolutely oh shut God. down Coleman's consume game. Nice. What a match. I mean, that went from game three to game five at record pace. You're not going to see anything go faster than that. <laughs> I mean, I need to collect myself. I'm not, I wasn't even I was ready for that transition. I mean, what else can you say? I mean, uh, JJ had the targeting strategy oh, ready man. to go, and uh, and it paid off for him. I mean, even Coleman had all the drives, all the neckers ready to go, but it wasn't enough. Coleman didn't even have to think about it because, you know, Ethne was there for that second artifact compression to lock it down. Lockdown is exactly what happened. JJ with his targeting strategy paying off. And he's going to be moving into the semifinal of the circle. Mago, do you have anything to say about that matchup? That I mean, it just goes <laughs> to show how uh, efficient targeting can be. And uh, we saw perhaps the this is the case in which targeting has, has been the most effective in uh, Gwent tournament history. Mm -hmm. And that was that was fascinating. Like I, I have no words. Like <laughs> to those two games ended so quickly. But like there's nothing you can do if you if your entire deck relies on one card. And mm -hmm. that card gets shut down. Like it's not even getting destroyed because mm -hmm. if you can uh, recycle them with lizard, it's getting 
banished from the game. Gone. Transformed. Stolen. Outstanding. Really, it's just, you know, Consume is very targetable. Consume doesn't have a great track record in tournaments, and I think that it maybe just had its most dominant defeat. Powell Burge is standing by with Super JJ right now to talk about that matchup. Take it away, my friend. Thank you, my beard. I'm here with Super JJ. Man, those were two very quick games, like super, super quick, but you had all the counters. Um, man, how do you feel? Yeah, I'm feeling quite great. I mean, I'm not too proud about my first games, which were not amongst monster, against Monster, but I didn't practice uh, against the other matchups too much, so I slipped off very, uh, a lot and I just didn't put too much resources into the other ones. So, yeah, it was just it's just about the Monster matchup for me. The rest doesn't really matter. Yeah, you were very teched against Monster. You had the muzzles, the artifact compression, and they just turned out for you perfect. I mean, that was awesome. And you're in the semis, so congratulations.